We have recovered 49 cannons from city dumps, from ditches, other strange places. We have brought some back from scrap metal merchants and we have put them back at historical sites where they are being used after. One fire! This is quite an important building, but it was not uh, the first building that was used as a fort to uh, protect Dutch interests, the uh, VOC or the Dutch East Indian Company, and also to keep the koi out. The first building was actually about, about, about six, 60 meters from here, which was Van Riebeek's fort, and that was built in 1652, almost immediately when Van Riebeek landed here. But the fort was too weak, uh, it was, the building material was wood and clay and mud and grass. So it broke down and uh, uh, by 1662 when Van Riebeek left, the idea of this very castle that you're in here, that you saw here today, was then uh, built. And if you look, it's, it's a star shaped uh, and it's built in a military style. If you look at the, uh, the surrounding areas uh, where cannons was put out, it's, it's really a, a very important building in not in South Africa's social history and uh, but also in South Africa's military history because uh, the army, the air force, the navy, all of those major formations under uh, Dutch rule, under British rule and under Union rule were all uh, operating from, from this castle of Good Hope. The castle was the headquarters for the army and I'm not just saying the South African National Defence Force as we know it today but even in colonial days even when it was the SADF this was always the headquarters for that so we've got the military museum that depicts the history throughout all those ages now a military history but also social history. When the uh, Europeans came the, the first the Spanish and then the Portuguese and the Dutch and the English they aggravated uh, that situation because for them it was about control of the seas. They wanted to get to the spices of the eastern countries, China, Japan, Indonesia, Jakarta and all those places. And the Cape, the southernmost part of South Africa, was an ideal point for them to stop. So the fact that they built this fort here was built on the fact that they wanted, protected, wanted to protect that interest. So as early as uh, 1510 already, uh, the, uh, the Portuguese under Francisca Almeida uh, clashed uh, not far from here uh, in, at the beach uh, over cattle and over misunderstandings and in that uh, battle over 60 of the Portuguese people very trained soldiers were, 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 were killed by the Khoi people were only fighting with their cattle and with uh, hardened sticks so they didn't have uh, swords they didn't have bows and arrows they only used their cattle and their military skills to fight the Portuguese. And that's why South Africa never became a Portuguese colony. That's why they went to Maputo. Even Van Riebeek built this, um, this uh, um, the bush, uh, you know, uh, wild almond bushes around the, uh, around the fort because he wanted to keep the koi out. So Doman was one of the koi leaders or, you know, one of the koi soldiers. Uh, realized that the Dutch people were here to settle when they start building the fort and building the castle. So he fought them in a series of wars, uh, but they eventually lost, uh, lost the wars against uh, the Dutch people. And so they also lost the land because the Dutch and the friends and the British operated on the principle that you've you invaded a land. There are people in that land and you are conquering that, the people, then you also have the land. So it was about armed colonial invasion and, and, and taking over. It was not simply an innocent halfway stop between Rotterdam and between Java or wherever they went to, 
but it was really to, 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 to take over the land because they could see the beautiful cattle, the beautiful women, the beautiful landscape, the fruit. And, 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 and so you, they used armed uh, techniques, uh, the sword and the gun to conquer the people of um, Southern Africa. And in the series of other wars that also followed after that, uh, the, um, the wars against the Kosa, against, you know, against the Zulu. And you've seen in the military museum that there's an uh, exhibition dealing with uh, King Tetswayo, the Zulu king. He was um, defeated at Ulundi after he first won the first battle. And th uh, th hundreds, if not thousands, of British soldiers uh, the biggest battle that British people were killed in at, at, at the battle and eventually they, the British brought in some fortifications and they then um, defeated him at Ulundi. He was detained and he was so-called housed or accommodated in the castle. But we know if you look at that room, he was really detained in that castle uh, to make a point before he uh, met the Queen of, 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 uh, of England to negotiate the land deals and that's why KwaZulu-Natal is there because of that, of that uh, negotiation. Such a lot of South Africans, even people that walk past here every single day, have never actually stepped foot into the space. I understand why. Um, you know, the space was built and designed to keep people out. It was built as a fort and it was built to protect. But we really want to open our front doors and tell everyone that walks to Golden Arrow bus terminus that's across the road or to the train station or wherever people come from in South Africa? You know, first of all, um, if you look at the periods, there was the period before the castle, uh, the, the, the Khoi and the San period. Then there was the period of the Dutch occupation of the castle for about almost 200 years. Then there was the British occupation from 1795. Uh, then again, there was the Dutch coming back as the Batavian Republic and then the Dutch, uh, sorry, and then the British took over again uh, f uh, from there and then the Union of South Africa and then the apartheid government and then post-apartheid where we are today. Now all those periods are represented in, in the castle. So it's very significant that we, that we put emphasis on all of those periods in, in, in equal terms because it shaped not only the military history but the social history. A lot of people say, do you want to rewrite history? You know, why are you doing that? We're not rewriting history. We are just telling stories of people that were also heroes, that were not recognized before. And we've done that in a tangible way with um, establishing the statues of the four uh, kings or warriors that's now standing right in front of the castle when you enter. But also in an intangible way, in the stories that we tell. So now we're telling story of master, but also that of slave. You know, also of the freedom fighters. We are also telling the stories of the people that first occupied this land prior to 1652 when Jan van Riebeek landed here. Land reform, uh, apartheid laws, um, the industrialization of South Africa, the homeland system, all of that can be traced back to that, to that military history that's uh, preserved in the uh, military museum. And I think what we've done um, over the last f couple of years, I think since we've been in civilian structure at least for four or five years, and specifically for the last two years when we commemorated the 350th um, commemoration of the castle, we really tried to expand the narrative. The idea of preserving the military history with the cultural history, with the industrial history, with the economic history is always very important uh, uh, for us so that we, don't, that we don't tackle heritage in a disjointed manner, but that we understand that it is almost like a puzzle that, uh, that to understand the one part, you, you, you need also to have knowledge to understand the other parts so that uh, the entire uh, human, social life is represented and understood by our, especially our young kids. We've decided that the castle used to be a place of exclusivity and the castle is actually a property that belongs to the people of South Africa. So if we want people to resonate with the property, we need to include everyone's story. We are PO Box 1 in Cape Town, so we, were, we pride ourselves as being sort of the beginning, you know, the first colonial building, but prior to that, also a site where the Khoi and the San used to, used to live and roam on. So 
everybody in South Africa. It's proven that the San and Koi DNA is the oldest DNA in the world. So everyone in South Africa, and even in the world, has got some link to the castle. And by telling an inclusive story and telling a story that's important to everyone, that includes everyone in this country, and promoting shared heritage, that is how we want to include and transform the space so that it, people feel that it belongs to them and it's not just a space where people were tortured prior, like in, in previous years. There, there are of course other museums on the castle premises that people visit but people always say ooh and ah when they go to the military museum because I think there they understand that the military as they know it has different dimensions. Uh, you, you, the, 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 the fights between, say for instance, the San and the Khoi is also military history. The first Dutch Khoi war is also military history. The uh, Battle of Ulundi is mili in military history. And they, they are very, very uh, intrigued by that. And very in interesting how Khoi and Klosa fought hand in hand against the British. And that story is not uh, always told, but the story is there. Uh, Mandela often refers to, if you look at his features, he's got koi features in it, and the four of the cliques in Xhosa language, is it Xhosa language, comes from the intermarriage between, between that. And I think that's portrayed there. Obviously, when you visit a space like this, it's, you know, it's a spiritual space, so everybody's um, experience of the space is different. However, we do have a wonderful tourism offering. People can decide if they wanted to walk on the ramparts and do their own thing. But I would highly suggest that people do a guided tour. Our tour guides are very experienced and quite entertaining. Um, we do tours every single day, seven days a week. We open every day of the year. And we do tours every hour on the hour. We also um, still perform the key ceremony while our resident guards perform the key ceremony, which is a traditional ceremony of what people would call the changing of the card, where they actually did the handover of the key. And it's quite um, an entertaining and quite a, a nice experience. That happens Monday to Friday. And then we also have the firing of the cannon. That is very entertaining, especially for, for youngsters. Um, and then, you know, just to come and experience history and to come and look for a little part of yourself that started 350 years ago. We want ordinary people also to come here, scholars, uh, students, working class people. That's why we have, apart from the normal entrance from nine to five, which is 50 rand for adults and 30 rand for, for, uh, for youth and nine, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, eight rand for, pu uh, for pupils in a group. We want all people to, be, to have this castle accessible. But besides that, we also have special days, like on Heritage Day, the 24th of this month, uh, the castle is free, so people can come in. On uh, May Day, it's free for workers. So, so we have these open days where people can, can really come in and experience a part of their history that I think you don't understand when you just stand outside because it, look, look, it looks very grey and drab and if we see some soldiers and you think can I go in there but once they're inside and they hear the firing of the cannon or they see the soldiers marching or they see the, the museum or they hear the birds and they hear the kids screaming then they understand that this is a living museum and so part, part and parcel of the history that they need to explore more and understand more. We've really been setting the trend for heritage sites to look at an expanded narrative. No, I just think in Heritage Month and in Tourism Month, in the month where we have AAD, the African uh, um, Airspace uh, you know, uh, Exp Expo, it's very important that people understand that all the developments that we see today, whether it's military, whether it's economic, whether it's cultural, all emanated from this place, the castle of Kudop. So let's truly embrace this and make this really uh, a castle of Kudop for the future.